Uh, tonight is, uh, um, I, I wanted just to um, share something about John that I appreciate. John is, um, he's a really busy guy, and he's, he's got a little bit of a name for himself. And um, um, I remember writing him last year, and we, and we couldn't get the, the date correctly. And when I wrote him earlier, earlier this fall and asked him to come here, he's just, just like that. He's willing to come here. He's willing to support uh, this kind of experiment um, in the cafe. And, you know, um, I, you are probably the same with me. We've admired and, and been fed from your writings and your character. You're just a great, wonderful man. And that I'm so, I'm, I'm thrilled to finally get to hear you talk. And I'm really happy that you're here. And more than anything, I was just, I'm, I'm just, um, that you would come so quickly and so willingly um, meant a lot to me. So I'm really grateful for you being here tonight and looking forward to what you got to say. Thank you, Rich, and thank all of you for coming out and making your way, finding your way through the fog to this place tonight. I am very honored to be here. It wasn't hard to say yes at all. In fact, it was an honor to be asked to come here, and I, uh, I really am grateful that this sort of place exists and that we, we get to to have conversation in a place like this. I want to wish you all a happy Take Back Your Time Day, because it, it is indeed Take Back Your Time Day. And if, if you don't know what Take Back Your Time Day is, I'll explain a little bit about that uh, later, because it has to do with a lot of the work that I do. Uh, I guess I've been interested in the whole subject of work time since I was a student in college way back in the 60s, and I was a sociology student at the University of Wisconsin in 1968, and I was taking a social problems class. And we were told that we sociologists were going to have to help solve this major social problem which was going to face the United States by the end of the 21st, 20th excuse me, century. And I wonder if anyone would like to venture a guess what this big social problem was going to be. Pardon? Speak up. Somebody's, okay, okay. This is crowd is too smart. I can go home now. This is good. I was just testing you to see whether I could walk out of the room and you'd already know all the answers. Yes, we were told at that time that because of automation and this coming computer revolution that they called cyber nation at the time, that by the year 2000, we would be so productive. We'd be able to make stuff twice as fast, three times as fast. We'd be so productive that we'd only have to work 15 to 20 hours a week paid. We would have seven to 10 weeks of vacation a year, and we would have so much leisure time on our hands, we wouldn't know what to do with it. And I remember thinking, wow, like that's a problem I can deal with. But it wasn't the problem that we got. And strangely, as a public television producer here in Seattle, by 1990, I was realizing that the opposite was true. That when before I used to meet people in the street and say, hi, how are you? And they'd say, fine. Now they just say, busy. That was the standard expression by that time. Um, you would try to have an appointment to say, I, I'm really a, sort of a social moth, and I like to get out and have conversations and lunches with everybody all the time. And, and uh, I found that you had to like, look in people's calendar a month ahead to have lunch. I mean, it was like, what is going on here? Everybody was just so busy. In fact, that year, Time Magazine ran a, ran a cover story called The Rat Race. And it was like, what is America becoming? We're all rushing like crazy. Um, right after that, Juliet Shore wrote a very popular book ca called the overworked American, and she made the case clearly that in fact, instead of working less, Americans were actually working longer hours, and in the case of two-parent families, significantly longer hours than they had been working in the 1960s. So something weird happened. And I wanted to, I asked, like, how did this occur? How do we get into this? Like, you know, what, what, what led to this? And was it a universal phenomenon? And I made a film for PBS, uh, that came out in 1994 called Running Out of Time, and um, looked at this whole issue and really discovered that there were a number of reasons for this, but certainly I think one of the big reasons why we are working longer, or at least have been until the recession cut it back a bit, uh, is that we have seen this immense increase in inequality. 
in this country. And so the average person actually hasn't gained uh, in income even though they've become twice as productive. And yet we still want the stuff and we still have been consuming the stuff. And so in order to do that, we have had to do two things. We have had to work longer, have more people in the family working, and we have had to get ourselves in lots of debt. That's the way that we have been able to accomplish that. And when I finished running out of time, and it had a premiere at UW, uh, a friend of mine, Vicki Robin, who many of you may know, um, has Vicki spoken here? Anyway, she's got a new book coming out in January about local food, so I think you'll like. Anyway, Vicki was the author of a very popular book called Your, uh, Your Money or Your Life, which some of you may have seen. And Vicki came bouncing down the stairs to me at UW, and she put her hands on my shoulder and looked me in the eye and said, John, you need to make a film about overconsumption, and I can help you find the money. And I said, Vicki, you just said the magic words. Why don't you come down to KCTS and let's talk about it? And indeed, she did help me find a major grant from the Pew Charitable Trust that led to my one uh, mini hit of a film, which was called Affluenza. And some of you may have heard of that. It later became a book. Oh, thank you if you've seen it. And uh, to put in a little plug here, the third edition of the book will be coming out in January of next year, uh, new and improved. Like, as seen on TV, you know, uh, all, that, all that stuff. So anyway, something to think about. But after I made Affluenza, I got invited to do a bunch of speaking and other things. And I wanted to actually get active again in the issues that my films were about. I didn't want to remain just a journalist, even though I was already a pretty partisan journalist. I call myself half fox. Uh, I'm fair but not balanced. <laughs> It's really hard to reach the Fox standards, but I'm halfway there, you know. So anyway, but my, my films did have a, have a point of view. And uh, as we got together, Vicki and I and a number of other people, we were talking about what can we do to fight this rush of consumerism in our country and all of its impacts. And we thought we can't take this on by just telling everybody to wear a hair shirt and live in a cave. We can't tell people, you got to sacrifice for the planet, et cetera, et cetera, because even if that might be true, it doesn't work. People just don't respond to that sort of thing. And so our view was that we had to tell, talk to people about the sacrifices they were already making in order to perpetuate this economy of mass consumption. And in our view, the biggest sacrifice was time, was the amount we had to work to pay for it all, and the impact of that on our health, on our families, on our communities, on our environment, and many other things. And so in 2002, we started this organization, Take Back Your Time. And we came up with the idea of Take Back Your Time Day, October 24th. We chose that because it was one week before Halloween. No, seriously, we chose it because it was nine weeks before the end of the year, and it represented the fact that in 2002, the average American worker was putting in nine full more weeks of paid time on the job each year than the average European worker. So think about that. If you'd been a European, you'd worked as many hours as uh, Americans had worked by that time, you could take the rest of the year off. So we picked October 24th, and for many years, in communities around the country, there have been Take Back Your Time Day celebrations, some of them bigger than others, and certainly there's been a decline in those, but some communities and some colleges are still celebrating the day, and I would like to revive it again. We worked on several things. We worked on things like paid family leave. In Washington, we passed a bill, but we didn't pass funding for it, so it sort of didn't matter too much. So officially, you have paid family leave in Washington, but no budget. Uh, and we worked on the issue of paid sick days, and as you all know, Seattle is one of the first cities in the country to actually pass a paid sick days law, giving people paid time off uh, when they're sick. By the way, there are only four countries in the entire world that do not provide at least paid maternity leave for moms when they have a baby by law. Those countries are the United States, Swaziland, Liberia, and Papua New Guinea. Now, when it comes to sick days, it's about the same. There's a handful of countries. And the third issue we started working on was the issue of vacation time, paid vacation time. Uh, Americans don't have any by law. 
In this, we are joined by four other nations in the entire world. Every other country has a paid vacation law. Those four are Suriname, Guyana, Nepal, and that paragon of human rights, Burma. Again, that's it. Every other country has at least a basic law, and if you live in Europe, you get at least four weeks off by law after your first week, uh, month, uh, year on the job. Getting ahead of myself here. And in some countries, you get more than that. So we wanted to get a vacation law passed. And in 2009, we worked with Congressman Alan Grayson of Florida. Uh, and I had the opportunity to actually write the first draft of a bill that was called the Paid Vacation Act of 2009. It was a very, very modest proposal. It would have required that American workers get at least one or two weeks off paid depending on the size of the company that they work for. Now remember, 25% of American workers get none, zero paid le uh, leave, and uh, many, many others get only uh, about a week. So this actually would have affected, you know, maybe 30% of workers in the country would have gotten something out of this bill. But it was extremely modest. It would have been laughable in any other country. People would have thought it was a joke. Are you kidding me? One or two weeks? You got to be. You know, you're crazy. Well, guess what the reaction was when this bill came into the Congress? The response was, oh my God, how can we possibly compete in the global economy if we give workers one or two weeks off? Think about that. The fact is everybody we compete with in the global economy gives workers more than that. But that didn't seem to dawn on those folks. I was on Fox News uh, nationally. And before I bash Fox News again, and I fully intend to bash Fox News again, but before I do that, I want to say that to its credit, Fox News was the only station that even covered the issue. So they had me on one of their national shows. It was the Neil Cavuto show, but some guy was subbing for Neil. And uh, in the course of this, I was over at in the studio at Fisher Broadcasting, and they were somewhere in the Ozone in New York. And uh, the host pointed at me. And he said, you, you, he said, you want to turn America into a 21st century, and he almost foamed at the mouth, France. <laughs> oh my God, no, not that, not that. We were gonna, I guess, apparently force Americans to appreciate good food and wine. <laughs> but this was, the character of the debate, and of course this bill got nowhere, and we, uh, I have some good news, and I hope you will support this. My state representative, Gail Tarleton, who I think many of you know, who represents Queen Anne and Magnolia, is going to introduce into the legislature this next year a bill for paid vacation time that would make Washington State the first state in the United States to actually have legal paid vacation uh, for workers, and uh, I, hope that uh, you will support her in that and that we can get a campaign going. I know there's a lot of doctors and other people who understand the importance of this. They know that, for instance, men who don't take regular vacations are a third more likely to have heart attacks than men who do. Women are 50% more likely. Women are uh, two to eight times more likely to be depressed if they don't take vacations regularly than if they do. So Gail will be entering, introducing a bill. We are working on the language now, and I don't know exactly how long she's going to go for, but I think we'll go for a little bit longer, knowing that they'll probably have to make comp compromises if the bill goes anywhere at all. But this is a work I have been involved in on the issue of time. And all of this led me to get a an undeserved reputation as an expert in the area of work-life balance. Now, you can ask my wife about how expert I am in, in work-life balance, and she would probably laugh at the whole thing, but the fact is, I got this reputation. And so in 2009, the same year we had the Vacation Act, I was invited to speak in Brazil at this beautiful, amazing bucket list place called Iguazu Falls which some of you may have the biggest waterfall in the world. It's just absolutely gorgeous. I was invited to speak at Iguazu Falls to the Fifth International Gross National Happiness Con Conference. <laughs> I am not making this up. I went to Brazil to speak at the Fifth International Gross National Happiness Conference, and there I met folks from this little Himalayan country called Bhutan, 
which some of you may have heard of, which lies between big China and big India. It only has about 750,000 people. What makes Bhutan interesting is that 40 years ago, a kid, a 16-year-old kid named Jigmi Singi Wangchuk became king of Bhutan on the death of his father. And the story goes that either at his coronation or sometime shortly thereafter, he was asked by an Australian reporter, well, King, what are you going to do to increase your country's gross national product? We called it gross national product then, now we call it GDP or gross domestic product. And I can explain the difference, but you don't necessarily want to know. Uh, so anyway, King Wong Chuck thought about this for a second. And since kids always say the darndest things, he said, well, sir, with all due respect, I believe that gross national happiness is more important than gross national product. Now, if any of our political leaders, save Robert Kennedy, who spoke about this quite eloquently in his presidential campaign, but if any other American politician ever brought this up in, in, in ter terms like this, we would have smiled or laughed and, or yawned and uh, politely and, and gone back to the business of making money. We might have even sent the folks with the white coats to come and, and so forth. But in Bhutan, the people take the king seriously. So they wanted to figure out, how do you operationalize this idea called gross national happiness anyway? And they brought lots of experts from different countries in various fields to their country to tell them how to figure that out. How do you make, how do you have policies that can make people happy. How do you measure that? And how do you figure out if your government is doing a good job? And they enshrined in their constitution uh, Article 9.2, which says that gross national happiness must be the purpose of the government of Bhutan. And one thing that Bhutan found was that this whole idea of happiness rests on conditions of life in a whole series of what Bhutan calls domains. And I'm going to just run these down quickly because this is what Bhutan measures to tell themselves how well they are doing. So the first one is living standards, and this is stuff, and you have to have a certain basic minimum of it. People need economic security, no question about it. It is not uh, a happy thing to live in dire poverty. But it's only one of nine things, not the be-all and end-all as it has been enshrined in our gross domestic product. Secondly, physical health. Third, mental health. Fourth, government. And this means a government that is transparent, that it is democratic, that it is participatory, that it is not completely uh, uh, owned by big money. Uh, so uh, in fact, when the king of Bhutan found out that a democratic government was essential to people's happiness, he abdicated and turned the country into a parliamentary democracy. Now, environment and access to nature, and we know that having green space, having these things available, it even makes you get healthy faster. You can be in a hospital bed in a room, and if you look out on green space, odds are you'll get well quicker than if you look out in a building across the street. We have a lot of studies that show this sort of thing. So environment, education, and this is not just formal education, but lifelong learning, the sense of, of being curious and of understanding things around, uh, about the world allows you to have considerably more happiness without always being entertained by more and more stuff. So that's important too. Uh, culture, and this is access to culture. In Bhutan, it meant the preservation of their own culture from an onslaught of Western consumerism and materialism. But for us, it means things like access to art and music and uh, these elements, literature, all of these aspects of our life uh, without which we are poorer and less happy. Most important of all, community, social connection, social support from friends and family, uh, social connection with the community, things like volunteering, all of those things we know are absolutely essential to, uh, to happiness and uh, they are really number one and they are also the most important thing that you can do for your health. In fact, the worst thing you can do for your health is to be lonesome. And in fact, if someone were to suddenly, we know this from the studies in Pittsburgh, that if someone were to suddenly release some flu and cold viruses into this room, the odds that you would get a cold or flu are most significantly uh, stand on, on one thing and that is the number of close friends and social 
connections you have. Friendship is an immune builder, and loneliness is just the opposite. And we are increasingly lonely in the United States. AARP, in cooperation with Time Magazine, published a UCLA study in 2010 that showed that in the previous decade alone, the percentage of Americans over 45 who could be characterized as chronically lonely had increased from 20% of the population to 35% of the population, almost doubling. That is an absolute disaster. It's a tragedy for the people who are lonely, and it, we will also pay hugely, big time for it, in our health care system because of the chronic illness that will result from it. Now, here's the one where I come in, time balance, and that's why the Bhutanese were actually interested in what I do, because they believe that uh, a, ba a balance of leisure and work is essential, and that living a rushed and hurried and stressful life is uh, very anti-happiness, if you will. And then finally, this one is not from Bhutan, but we added this. I'm working with a group on this, and this is work satisfaction. How do you feel about your job? Are you doing something meaningful with your work? Do you have your, a boss who's a jerk or a nice person? Do you have a sense of control? Do you have adequate uh, uh, remuneration and adequate flexibility in hours? All of these things in our society are hugely important for happiness, though somewhat less so in Bhutan where people do not m normally work in large offices and factories. So we, I came back from Brazil having met a number of people from Victoria, BC, who were actually using these domains to survey Victoria's population to see how well they were doing. And I, I was amazed by this, because I never saw it in our papers, and Victoria is only 80 miles away, but it was a great thing. So I, I invited the head of that project, a fellow named Michael Pennick, to come down and talk to the Seattle City Council. And we then developed a a thing called the Happiness Initiative here in Seattle. You can find that at the website happycounts.org. And we put on that site a survey now that takes about 15 minutes. And when you take that survey, you will get a score in each of these dimensions of life and a comparison with the national US average. So you have a sense of how uh, you are doing. And uh, we did that in Seattle. We provided a report card for the city of Seattle. And we have now, uh, in the Happiness Initiative, which is led by Laura Musikansky, um, who was the former director of Sustainable Seattle, uh, we have been working with many cities and colleges around the country to do these initiatives. So I just got back from a two-week speaking uh, trip where I signed up Duluth, Minnesota, and Burnsville, Minnesota, a Minneapolis suburb and then some colleges in other uh, places uh, around uh, the, the upper Midwest to do these initiatives. Our most significant one, I think, was with the city of Eau Claire, Wisconsin, which just did a bang up job with this, and you can see what they've done. So as a result of this work, uh, I was invited again to Brazil last fall to speak at another international happiness conference that turned out to be totally in Portuguese without translation. Uh, which was a little tough on me, but my, my talk was translated from English to Portuguese, and so was the other English speaker who happened to be a fellow named Karma Ura, who runs Bhutan's whole happiness program. And Karma and I were kind of in a rough way because we didn't speak Portuguese, and so we spent a lot of time together, and uh, we got to know each other well, and he invited me to come to Bhutan this past January and fe February, as a, an advisor to their government for a big report that they were doing for the United Nations. And so I had the opportunity to be there with about 40 other so-called experts from uh, many, about 20 different countries, including uh, parliament members, the head of the European Environment Agency, all kinds of people that made me look like a, a very s small fish in a big pond. And uh, we, we talked together we met for four days with the prime minister and the cabinet. We met the king and queen. We had extensive discussions uh, with each other. And we found out that we had some differences. And I'll go through this quickly. But the main two differences were between people who believe that the route to happiness is through public policy change and other people who believe that the route to happiness is through personal change in personal attitudes and behaviors. The other object of debate was between the word that was the people who liked the word happiness 
and the others who don't. And there are literally lots of academics and policy people who actually cringe when they hear the word happiness. They get all creepy. And they really can't handle it. They, they think it's this sort of amorphous, silly thing. And they can't imagine that happiness could have anything to do with public policy, which is sort of strange in a country like the United States, uh, which was founded on the principle of the pursuit of happiness and where the, our four most famous so-called founding fathers, uh, Mr. Washington, Mr. Adams, Mr. Jefferson, and Mr. Franklin, all said on a number of occasions that the sole orthodox purpose of government is increasing the happiness of the people. It's not economic growth. It's certainly not making the rich richer. It's increasing the happiness uh, of the people. So anyway, in the midst of this debate, we were having this debate because some people like happiness and some people don't. And in the midst of this debate, a fellow named Enrico Giovannini, who is now the Minister of Labor in the government of Italy, amazing guy, uh, my, a friend of mine in Italy said, Enrico is a wonderful human being. He's the highlight of a very bad government, and I cannot see how he can last. But in any case, Enrico said, hey, folks, we got to stop bickering. we got to figure out and understand that all of this matters. And so what he did is he said, let's look at how all of this fits together. And Enrico showed us that people have needs that our economic system, the economy, is meant to convert resources to meet needs. How well it does this, we can tell in two ways. One is by what he said we think of as well-being. And well-being, we can define as those aspects of the conditions or quality of life that can be measured objectively. So if we look at health, well-being is things like life expectancy, infant mortality, obesity, all of these kind of things. You can do it for all the domains, and that's what we did for all the domains. Now, there's another side to this, and this is what we call happiness. And happiness is those aspects of the quality of life that we measure subjectively through surveys. And so when it comes to health, we ask people, how do you feel about your health? My health is good. It's excellent. I, I'm in pain most of the time, or I'm not, and I feel good about my life. You can do that, again, for all of these. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean this. This is important, and well-being is the purpose of public policy, to, to improve the conditions of life in a measurable sense that we call well-being. Now, in between the two, and well-being doesn't always lead to happiness, because supposing you get more leisure time, you can measure that uh, objectively, but you spend all that time watching television. The odds are that you will actually be less happy rather than more happy. But you'd be much more happy if you got out in community and nature and connection with people. So in between these two things are what we call happiness skills. And these happiness skills are the purpose of education, and they are the things that have been taught to us by our great faith and wisdom traditions, by now positive psychology, by neuroscience, they are finding all the same things. And of course, one of those important things, uh, as we know, is that it is better to give than to receive. This is Christian tradition. It's tradition in other uh, faiths. But it's also solid science. We know that being generous, being having gratitude, having compassion, being sharing, uh, giving of oneself, and then things like being patient and having, uh, being able to delay gratification, uh, all kinds of things are these skills which translate well-being into so societal happiness. And so we, we have been working on how to present this to uh, the United Nations and to look at some kind of ways in which internationally we can begin to measure these things and work on these things. Both clearly are important. This one is the stuff of personal change, and it is important. This is the stuff of policy. This is even more important in countries which are very poor and very unequal. This is more important probably in countries where uh, already they've attained pretty high uh, economic levels and where there is a great deal of equality. There aren't too many of those countries, as you might imagine, but both are important. Now, one thing we find is that the lowest score in the United States on our surveys of all these domains, and we measure this happiness, are in this area of time balance. Uh, 
The second lowest in the United States scores are in the area of government, confidence in government. You might not be surprised by that, and I, we haven't looked at the data for the last month. So <laughs> we have a feeling that uh, confidence in government may have trumped uh, time balance as the lowest score in the United States during that period, but I don't know yet. But nonetheless, Americans feel very, very stressed for time, and it has huge impacts on our health, on our family life, on our social connections, and also on our environment. The Swedes are doing a lot of studies along this line that show, for example, that simply reducing working hours has a huge effect on greenhouse gas emissions. Very, very important. That this is key work not right now of the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency, and if anybody's interested, I can show you, uh, uh, give you links to some of the connections of this kind of work. Very, very uh, important work. But uh, the other thing is time balance has a, a big effect on many, many things, and I just want to get into one before I come to the very end of this talk. I'm almost done. Where am I? How, how, how long have I been going? Oh. Okay, well, I don't have too much more to go. But I, I know that in this country, we have an attitude that those namby-pamby nanny states, which, by the way, according to Gallup, are the happiest countries in the world. It, Gallup uh, surveys 1,000 Americans every day as to how happy they are, and it finds, and it's a good thing you're all sitting down, <laughs> because this is going to come as a shock, that Gallup finds that Americans, dare I say it, are 20% happier on weekends than on work days. <laughs> Could have fooled me, right? And 30% and happier on holidays than on work days. And Gallup then surveys 150 countries around the world with about 1,000 to 3,000 people being surveyed in each country each year. And Gallup has a whole ranking of the entire world based on happiness levels. And it, it's more complex, but you can find that online. You can go to the World Happiness Report 2013 of the United Nations. And if you go to the second chapter of that report, just, just Google it, you will find the entire world laid out in terms of life satisfaction and happiness. So anybody know what the number one country in the world is in happiness? Who said, what did you say? Denmark. Denmark is the correct, Denmark is the correct answer. I knew someone would get it in this room. Uh, Denmark is the correct answer, followed by several other Nordic and Northern European countries, including Norway, Finland, the Netherlands, uh, Switzerland, and uh, Sweden, for example. So um, the United States doesn't do too bad. We rank 17th in the world, uh, although we have dropped from 11th in the last five years, uh, so we've had some, some, some hits from the, from the current recession. But in any case, we don't do too bad when it comes to adult happiness. Now, another issue, and, and, and most, lots of Americans, it's very much the conservative philosophy that you don't want to do things like these nanny states do. These nanny states are the happiest places in the world. They have several things in common. Number one, they are, have the smallest gap between rich and poor of any, uh, of any rich countries, and we in the United States have by far the widest gap between rich and poor. They have the shortest working hours in the world, particularly the slacker Norwegians and Dutch, who are right at the bottom of the pile. And uh, compared to us, who have some of the longest, though not the longest, the, the Greeks, you know, who we're always thinking of as you know, Greece and its mess actually worked the longest hours in Europe. And the Japanese are about the same as us. The South Koreans are real nose to the grindstone and so forth. But uh, they have the shortest working hours. They have the strongest social safety net that provides for people when times are tough. And I, I hesitate to say this, you know, but in this room maybe it's okay. I know that I would kind of be taken out and tarred and feathered in some places in the United States, but guess what? They pay the highest taxes of any countries on earth. Absolutely, every single one of them. And there is no question about this data. It's as clear as a bell. It is not rocket science. Now, Americans, though, will say, well, you know, we don't, adults can take care of themselves. You know, they, they don't need help from the government. 
they don't need all this kind of stuff and we don't want to take the money from the producers and give it to the takers and you've heard this kind of tea party stuff. Um, but you know, what I want to point out is why don't we look at kids? Because you're not, not too many people, even in the tea party, who are going to say that a five-year-old ought to pull himself up by his bootstraps. It's not really all that likely to happen, and they understand it. So how many of you have seen, and you can Google this as well, how many of you seen the 2013 UNICEF report on child well-being in rich countries? That's what it's called. Anybody seen that? Anybody heard of it? You've heard of it. It was not reported on in any American newspaper, although it was the front page headline story in every major Canadian newspaper, and in newspapers almost all over the world. And what this survey, this UNICEF study does, is it looks at 29 countries, the world's wealthiest 29 countries, or, uh, and that we have data for, and then it looks at a couple of other wealth, wealthy countries where less data is available. And guess where we place out of 29 in the well-being of children? Not 29. It's not that bad. Romania is 29. <laughs> Latvia is 28. Lithuania is 27. 26 is the right answer. <laughs> 26th is the answer. Now, what this does is it looks at five key areas of children's lives. So it looks at material well-being, what is the poverty rate, what is the security that these children have uh, in their lives, the material security. It looks at physical health. It looks at risky behaviors and safety. Uh, it looks at environment, environmental pollution and quality of housing conditions, and um, I'm forgetting one, uh, oh, um, it looks at education. So these five areas, and uh, interestingly enough, the United States, the best we do in any of these five areas is 23rd, and that's in education, um, and the worst we do is 28th, uh, but uh, not so good, not so good at all. And then they also ask children uh, above the ages of 12 in all of those countries, how satisfied are you with your life? Think of a ladder with steps between 0 and 10. Where would you put yourself? How, how satisfied would you say you are about your life? And when it comes to subjective satisfaction, the US, US children rank 23rd. We do a little bit better than we do in the objective data, but it, it's nothing to write home about. Now, the Canadians rank 17th, and they were absolutely aghast. And they said, this cannot be. The Brits ranked 16th, and they were absolutely aghast and said, this shall not stand. We have to do something about this. We can't, we're a, we're a wealthy country. We are proud of what we do. We can't have our kids in 16th place, 17th. We're 26, no one yawned. I mean, that's about all they did do was yawn. No one, no one did more than yawn or even look at this. Uh, it's amazing. Now, it's interesting to look at who the top country is and the top five countries, and the top five countries are exactly the same countries, essentially a couple of minor variations as for adults. But the number one country, uh, by a long shot, actually, is the Netherlands. It ranks first in three of the five objective category, and number one in the subjective, how do kids feel about their lives category. And the question is why? Uh, and so you can Google this, you can, you, can, you can Google why are Dutch kids so happy? And you will get all kinds of little citations that go, why are Dutch kids so happy? No, Dutch kids happiest in the world, how is it, etc. Well, basically it boils down to one particular thing. Their parents have lots of time for them. And they have time for them because there are laws in the Netherlands that really encourage parents with children to work part-time. And both parents, so it is typical in Dutch families that both parents work part-time. They receive additional support for their kids. They have the right to go to part-time work without losing their job. Uh, their uh, benefits are prorated. They keep the same 
hourly salary. There are many, they go into lower tax brackets, and they love this. And it is hugely popular, and this same policy now is being adopted in Germany and Belgium and will probably be adopted throughout the European Union. Now, how did this policy, which is called the Working Hours Adjustment Act, which was passed in 2000 in the Netherlands, who passed this and why? It's a good question. Um, sounds pretty liberal to me, right? I mean, socialistic. You know, this, this kind of thing, government stepping in and helping all this. Well, you know, it turns out this law was passed by the conservative party in the Netherlands, the Christian Democratic Party, which took its Christianity seriously and which had a whole campaign, like we've heard in this country, about family values. We need to value families. And how do you value families? You make it possible for families to be together and spend time together. You don't say parents can't have any leave when they have a kid. You don't make parents work overtime and put kids in daycare at one month and do all the kinds of things that we take for granted in this country, punish parents for taking time off even when their children are sick, and we fire thousands of people each year because they took time off for being sick. Uh, we do that, you know. I mean, it's, it's uh, but anyway, they believed in this, and so, uh, the Dutch Prime Minister at that time, a guy named Rud Lubbers, said, it's uh, true that uh, we work hard in the Netherlands, that uh, we, we're very productive. However, we don't work long. Our hours of work are rather short. In fact, they are indeed, the sh along with the Norwegians, the shortest in the world. He said, we like it that way because that makes it possible for us to take care of all those other important non-material aspects of life, taking care of each other, volunteering, being out in nature, all of these kind of things for which we are not paid and for which there is never enough time." End of quote. This is family values. This, in fact, is, you know, uh, and, and I, I say this without trying, I don't want to get preachy, but I am in a church, so um, I, I say that this is this is religious values. This is practicing these kinds of things. Somehow we have not got this through our head as a nation that it is not rocket science. It makes sense to take care of our kids. It makes sense to have parents and the community have time to spend with their kids and the result is positive. And the children are better off for it and they become more productive and more um, and better citizens uh, for doing so. So let me finish up by saying that um, I've talked about this a lot. Um, you know about the Occupy movement. It started in Zuccotti Park uh, in September of, 19, of, of 2011 in New York City. What you may not know is that there was an original Occupy movement and there was a novel written about it which was published in Lower New York in September of 1911, exactly 100 years to the month before the Occupy movement. And the title of that novel is, and you can read it free online, the title of that novel is The Nine Tenths. And it is about the 99%, except it's a little more realistic because it really is more like nine tenths who were, who were suffering. And, and it is written this novel by a man named James Oppenheim, who is much more famous for writing a poem, later turned into a song, which you can also listen to. It's a beautiful song. You can listen to Judy Collins' version, or Joan Baez, or John Denver, whoever you like. There's all kinds of versions online. It's called Bread and Roses. You've probably heard that song or heard of the poem. Um, the story is that the poem was written for to commemorate the Lawrence Textile Strike in Massachusetts in 1912, but that's sort of impossible because the poem was written in 1911, so unless the writer were clairvoyant, that could not have uh, been, been the case. Uh, it was actually written about, uh, about a great uprising in New York City called the Uprising of the 30,000, in which thousands of textile workers walked out of their mills to protest, uh, uh, to, to fight for safety rules, for higher wages and for shorter hours. But in the poem and in also in Lawrence where striking 
women were said to have carried banners that said, we want bread and roses too. Bread is the symbol of money, of higher wages, of stuff. The same way we use the word colloquially uh, ourselves. Uh, and up to a point, we really need it, no question about it. It's not good to be dire poor. But roses are the symbol of shorter hours, shorter work time, time to smell the roses, time, in the words of the poem, for art, for love, for beauty, for all the things their drudging spirits never knew. Time for all of the material things in life, the things that are not things but are the best things in life. And I think we have made a mistake in this country, and particularly since World War II, in which we have really put all of the emphasis on the bread and on the money and on the consuming, but we've left the roses to wilt. And in my view, it's time to water them again. Thank you. If anybody has any questions, comments, or tomatoes, let them fly. Yes. Um, I was in Bhutan about eight years, six or eight years ago, mm -hmm. and they were just starting to become a so-called democracy. Everybody right. loved the king, but he decided. And right. so yeah. you've been here. You you're there. You were there recently. How is it changed? I, I was I was there with with a, a Bhutanese, and I met his family and. Uh, I was talking about not trying to prevent Bhutan from being a big, you know, tourist place. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering how, uh, how you found it. Well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, for one thing, I want to I wanna get rid of the idea which is too much in the media and which the people in Bhutan really don't like at all, that somehow Bhutan is the world's happiest country. It is not. It never claims to be. And its view is that it would like to be much happier than it is. Bhutan is a poor country. It uh, is uh, surprisingly neat in many ways. Uh, there, I saw no beggars. I saw no. Um, um, uh, homeless people in Bhutan. I did see drunks. Alcoholism is actually a, a, a serious problem that the government is aware of. It actually comes from a couple of factors, one being that alcohol is quite cheap there and it's very strong. And number two, it comes from the factor that it is a part of sociability and Bhutanese are very social and have l constant dinner parties with large groups of people where the ara the rice wine uh, flows. And I uh, was invited to several of those and did my best to retain my sobriety. But I'm not sure I was always successful. Uh, in any case, Bhutan has been, uh, did become, uh, Again, in 2008 was his first parliamentary election, just had a second parliamentary election this year. Um, the king, the young king, I had the chance to meet. Uh, his name is also Jimmy Wongchuk, he has some different middle names. And I met the queen, her name is Jetson Pema. Uh, they are tall for Bhutanese. The king is nearly six feet tall, and most Bhutanese are much smaller. And they are crazy about basketball. <laughs> And so I, I'll just tell you a little fun incident. When I met the king, I'd heard that the king liked basketball. And so the first thing the king, there was a little group of us, and the king came up to us, and he cracked a joke. So I figured it was OK, even in the presence of royalty, to crack a joke of my own. So I said, well, sir, you know, your majesty, I, I hear you're, um, you're quite the basketball player. And he said, well, I try. He said, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to be doing archery, because that's our national support. But I've never been any good at that. And what I really like is basketball. And I said, well, you know, I'm from the United States, and we have a president who likes basketball. And he said, oh, I know that. And I understand that he's very competitive, and he uses his elbows a lot. And he said, you know, what I'd really like to do is play a game of basketball with President Obama. So I said, well, you know, I know some people that at least I can see if they would, could get that question to President Obama to see if that might happen. And, and so we let that pass. And then a little while later, I was actually engaged in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the prime minister, uh, who uh, it was also ironically about sports, because he went to Penn State. And so we were talking about the whole state of the athletic department at Penn State and the awful things that had happened there. And the king walks over, and the king and the queen, and the king says, were you serious about that thing about asking Obama to play 
play me a game of basketball. <laughs> this is the king, right? Number one, I never thought I'd meet a king. Number two, I didn't think I'd be, this is what we'd have our conversation about. And then the queen says, and if you can make it happen, I, I'd really like, like it if the game were in California, because the king and I have been to New York and Washington, D.C., but we'd really like to visit California. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see what we can do. So anyway, um, it is in the, potentially in the works, but I don't know what's going to come of it. Um, final thing on your question. Um, Bhutan is having to deal with a lot of issues. Uh, certainly the children have to face a real onslaught of consumerism, and you can see that in all the brand name things that kids wear. Um, but secondly, Bhutan just had an election which, in which the party that brought me to Bhutan, in which I spent a lot of time with, lost. And the new party uh, uh, it wants to focus its attention much more internally around things and not uh, so internationally as the former government has done in taking all of this stuff to the United Nations, bringing all these people from other countries like myself. And so it's too early to tell what all of this is going to mean, but I think Bhutan is going to play a much more subdued role in the whole happiness movement around the world. And uh, some of others of us will have to take up that mantle. Yes. Uh, John, in all of your uh many years of studying happiness and you refer to you know googling uh, in your talk what is your perspective on the role of social media today and how it's affecting happiness you know i it may be too early to tell totally uh, um, you know, I like to hedge my bets a little bit. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not a very outspoken guy, so you know, I kind of like to be moderate in all things. And I, don't think that's true. And <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I think social media has polarizing effects. I think for some people, it's actually bringing them together and connecting people, and who also use it for real. I, I have to be honest with you. I like Facebook, and I have made lots of real friends who I've. Uh, originally was connected to on Facebook and then met them in reality and have, have, have great friendships with them. Uh, on the other hand, I do believe that it can also become just a sink of time and people can be disconnected and they can use it for, you know, I, I once just as a joke, I posted on Facebook a little thing that said, today I stubbed my toe, it hurts like hell, the doctor says I will live. Well, I got more responses of people actually saying, oh, that's too bad, I'm feeling sorry. It was meant to be a joke, you know, to that comment on Facebook than to anything I ever posted. And, I mean, and so then I'm, it's sort of telling me, well, I don't know, you know, I, some second thoughts. But um, I guess it depends on how we, we use it, like everything else. It's, it's a tool, and uh, I do believe that um, it, um, it has some positive potential, but it also has a lot of potential for negative uh, impact, and just kind of have to figure out how it how it plays out. Yes. Um, I, I asked my group, you know, but uh, I like to ask you directly. You know, you talk about happiness uh, scale. Mm -hmm. Have you done that within this country from about 1950 to present, every decade? I have a feeling that the ha happiness, our happiness went down here as a num number of spouses start working together, working, you know, both are working. I think they go opposite direction. You know, I don't want to say that. I think if you look at happiness trends in the United States since the 50s, they haven't really gone down, they're flat. They go down a little, they go up a little, but essentially they're flat. But the interesting thing, of course, is that GDP has has risen enormously, and and happiness and what we might we refer to in uh, it's a measurement used in some states called genuine progress indicator is actually flat or maybe slightly falling. But there are so many factors that play a role in that. I would children. pardon children. Children's happiness. We don't have enough measurement of that going back in time. It's really new to even start doing that. So I don't think, I think we can go, the first uh, evidence of that is around 2007 where we started to do that. Pretty much no change. I guess there was a slight, 
a very slight uptick in kids' happiness in the U.S. since 2007, but not much. It's, it's generally pretty flat. So I don't know. But I think there are so many factors that go into this. And, and I, I think, um, obviously, I believe both parents should have the equal right to be in the workplace. I think they ought to be in the workplace 30 hours a week instead of 50, uh, maybe, or 24. Or, and I don't understand how it is possible that one wage earner working 40 hours a week could support a family, a larger family, when I was a kid, and two wage earners today working full time are having more trouble. I mean, that, that in, in, while our productivity has, has more than doubled, it's, it's tripled since I was a kid. I mean, that's just, there's no way to explain that except the, the rampant increase in inequality in this country, the fact that all the gains have really gone to the 1% or 2% or whatever. Yes? The Scandinavian countries are doing really well, and I just read about it again recently just to refresh my memory. And when I discuss this with people, what I usually hear, and I would like you to address this, what I usually hear is that these are really small countries with very, very small populations like Norway, 40 million people, and we have 330 million. And that is the difference. Well, that, there are lots of small countries where people are not happy. I mean, it isn't a matter of just people being. And, and if you look at economically, you can say that these countries have some advantages by being small and by being more homogeneous, although they're not nearly as homogeneous as we think. For example, the city now in the world that has the highest percentage of foreign-born residents is Amsterdam. LA is second. Actually, but but so d diversity is happening in these uh, these places as well. But I think policy is far more important than. Uh, and remember that the United States led in almost all of these categories after World War II. We were just about the healthiest folks. Well, of course, these other countries were kind of bombed out and everything. But for but for for a period, we were we had uh, up until in the 1970s, Americans worked fewer hours each year than Europeans. Uh, this has all changed really since the so-called Reagan Revolution. Um, uh, we were, you know, maybe we were probably a little better than the middle among these industrial countries at that time. Now we're dead last in virtually everything you look at. So I don't think you can simply blame that on the size of population. And remember that when we argue about the economy, we have some disadvantages in being so big and maybe unwieldy, but we have some major advantages. We have an enormous domestic market. We sell 86% of what we produce to people in this country. Now think of a Finland or a Denmark or Sweden, they are having to sell half of what they produce on the world market. So they have to be competitive. So somehow they have to be able to produce goods cheap enough to sell them on the world market, but they manage to do that paying wages, minimum wages of $20 an hour, uh, providing five weeks of vacation a year, providing free health care, providing all kinds of services uh, to people, uh, and uh, you know, so I think you can you can say that it's harder in this country to get people to agree on policy. That's the major difference, and we are more polarized in the in this country. But I don't think it's just the size of the country. So there's been a number of speakers for at least ten years that I've been aware of that say uh, that attribute most of social ills to income inequality. Stephen Bedruska, professor at UW, and a number of others. And they really don't talk very much about these other um, policy, uh, you know, uh, choices about family leave and the other, you know, the, the things that are non-financial. And so, the I guess what I'm saying is, are they wrong by saying that um, <clears throat> that income by by addressing income inequality, like uh, for example, fifteen dollar an hour is the current. Uh, are they wrong to say that uh, that would be a really promising path? No, I don't. I don't think that they're wrong. I think they're, it's incomplete. And I, I know Stephen very well. He's a good, and him, the work that he's doing is hugely important. And I, I, I support it. And Robert Reich and others who are who are pointing these things out. Where I think we go wrong 
is in thinking that it's only that and that people only have to have incomes raised, that they don't need these other things like time in their lives and stuff. And I think that, that progressives ever since World War II have really forgotten the roses. Now, they didn't forget the roses before World War II. It was always central to the labor union movement. In fact, uh, the early AFL and the CIO used to often say that time was even more important and more valuable to the worker than money, and that the worker needed time not just to lay around in a hammock, but time to take care of the community, to be engaged as a citizen, to learn, to do all of these kind of things. That has been eliminated from our movement. The other thing that I find is a huge problem with many of my progressive friends is their absolute obsession with the concept of economic growth. I do believe that the idea that growth is the answer to all of our problems, and in this, the Republicans and Democrats are not very far apart. They have different ideas about how to get growth. One says austerity and one says stimulus, but they both believe that economic growth is the path to, to people being better off. I think this is absolute madness. Let me, let me just lay this out really quickly. Again, because we're in a church, I'm going to give a, a, a quick sermon. This is a sermon that I was taught by my personal hero, a man named David Brown who built the Sierra Club, founded Friends of the Earth, and so forth. And he used to give this sermon in the last years of his life. And in that sermon, he took the age of the Earth, estimated by scientists at some 4.6 billion years, and compressed it into one week, the biblical week of creation, if you, if you want to look at it that way. And in that case, a day is 650 million years, an hour 27 million, a minute uh, is... 450,000 years, and a second is 7,500 years. Now, you do this, you find that Earth starts Sunday morning, life appears sometime on Tuesday afternoon. In the next few days, it becomes ever more complex and wondrous and beautiful. And then on the last day, Saturday, at about noon, those big animals appear, the great reptiles, the dinosaurs, appear on the planet. They have a long run. They last till 4 or 5 in the afternoon uh, when they're their time is cut short by an asteroid crashing into the Gulf of Mexico, which makes the, the world too, too cold to them. Uh, now the mammals appear, and at three minutes before midnight, on the very final night of the week, human beings appear on the planet. At one third of a second before midnight, on the last night, Buddha is born. At one quarter of a second before midnight, Christ is born. At one twenty-fifth of a second before midnight, the Industrial Revolution begins. And at one one-hundredth of a second before midnight, on the final night, the consumer society begins. In that one one-hundredth of a second, we have managed to use more resources than all human beings who all ever lived in all of history all put together did before that time. We have cut our soils and our fisheries and our fossil fuels and who knows what other resources by half. We have caused the extinction of countless species, and we are significantly changing the climate. And Brower said there are people who believe that what we've been doing for that last hundredth of a second can go on indefinitely. They are considered reasonable, normal, intelligent people. In fact, they run our corporations. They run our government. Some of them are even liberals. Uh, but they are stark raving mad. Just think about what we have done in this tiny glimpse of a geological eye, and you understand that this cannot simply go on. We have to find a way to live better without consuming more and more and more. Technology can help, but it cannot solve this problem completely. If everyone on Earth were to suddenly consume, at the American level, we would need five planets to provide the resources and absorb the waste. As Alan Durning says, we're four planets short. Um, you know, so these are, these are the places where I differ with other progressives. I don't differ at all on the importance of dealing with inequality. But I think we also need to talk about time, about non-materialistic values that matter, and we need to talk about growth. And we need to talk about growth as something that simply is not unlimited. <laughs> well, I don't know. You know, Paul Krugman, I love Paul Krugman, but he, he thinks growth is still the you know, be all and end all. Yes? Who quickly said what you just said, that whole 
Who said that? Yeah, yeah. where did you get that from? David Brower, yeah. Who, uh, and, I, and David Brower taught me the meaning of the word happiness, so I, would, I will give you my definition. Uh, I knew him very well. I made a PBS documentary about his life, and I went to see him five days before he died uh, when he was at a place called Alta Bates Hospital in 2000 in Berkeley, California. And he was sick with cancer, and it was clear that the end was near, but when we left, I wanted to cheer him up. So I said, Dave, I hope that next time I see you, you'll be out there healthy again and fighting the good fight. And he looked me in the eye, and he said, John, I don't think that's in the cards, but it's been a great 88 years. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we all want to be able to say, however much time we have on this planet, that we have made a difference in our time here, and that's what I ask you to keep doing. Thank you. Thank you.